Welcome to part three of this series. In this short presentation, we will discuss key principles in reviewing GLIM articles for publication. Key points for retrospective and prospective studies will be reviewed. High quality GLIM descriptive and or validation studies will include these principles. This is the third module in the series focused on supporting the use and validation testing of GLIM. This short presentation will review key aspects that should be considered when reviewing a submitted article or when drafting a GLIM validation paper. While GLIM is being implemented worldwide, studies describing its use and evaluating its validity and reliability are also being published. Of course, when reviewing these studies on GLIM, the basic tenets of science should be considered. Are ethics principles adhered to? Is there a clear study goal? And has a sample size calculation been made? This is specifically important as most studies to date on GLIM, as of early 2021, are secondary studies based on data previously collected for other purposes. These retrospective studies typically determine predictive validity of GLIM only. Retrospective studies may not be sufficient in many respects to determine validity and reliability of GLIM. A sample size calculation is a first step to determining if the study has sufficient power to reach this aim. By now, you are aware that GLIM consists of different criteria, three phenotypic and two etiologic criteria. To be able to better understand how GLIM works, it is important that validation studies describe clearly which combinations of the five criteria have been used. It is known that different criteria can fit better to some diseases, but less so with others. For example, the BMI criterion may be less relevant for an obese population because it will never reach the cutoff point. In contrast, body composition may be very informative for the obese, considering specifically sarcopenic obesity. Likewise, inflammation may be more relevant for an ICU population and dietary intake for a geriatric population. Hence, methods of submitted articles need to clearly define which combinations of the criteria have been used to determine the validity of GLIM. Also, for a criterion validity, the criterion used should be clearly described. Unfortunately, some studies that are being published include a screening tool as the criterion, which is a significant flaw. As shown in Section 2 of this series on GLIM, the optimal criterion is assessment by professional in nutrition. Alternatively, subject global assessment, patient-generated subject global assessment, or the mini nutrition assessment full form can be used. Consider if the sample size estimated was reached and if the appropriate statistics were completed. For refresher on appropriate statistics, review the validation guidance paper and the, second and the second presentation in this series. Results should include prevalence of malnutrition, considering the diverse combinations of GLIM, as well as the prevalence when the criterion is used. Graphical presentations such as a Venn diagram can be used to demonstrate the overlap in those identified as malnourished using different combinations of criteria. Alternatively, a table outlining the prevalence resulting from different criteria combinations would be useful. Of course, the discussion should provide the strengths and limitations of the study, and particularly focus on the choice of GLIM parameters if not all of them have been used in the study. Let's discuss retrospective studies in a little more detail. Until now, most studies published on GLIM are retrospective, which means they are limited in the methods used to collect nutrition information. Preferably, at least four variables are used in retrospective studies, and it should be described which ones were used and those not included. For example, a study which uses BMI, a phenotypic criteria, and the assumption that inflammation is present in all ICU patients, an etiologic criteria, may have different results than if body composition and nutritional intake as percentage requirements were used in the same group of patients. Further, prevalence of malnutrition will vary dependent on the criteria used. For the future, there is no wrong combination as long as at least one phenotypic and one etiologic criterion are used.
But studies need to describe which parameters were used, how they were collected, for example measured, or inflammation based on CRP, or assumption that certain diseases come with inflammation, and which cutoffs were applied. Prefer preferably, it is also described how data were collected, especially of importance for body composition and dietary intake, because methods used may influence the results. This information is needed to further refine GLIM and understand better measures of these criteria. It is important to note in reviewing retrospective validation studies that authors should preferably use objective methods for the etiologic criteria. If they do not, this is a limitation and should be noted in the paper as such. This is an area of GLIM that needs validation and where retrospective studies can be helpful. It is likely that certain diseases, such as active cancer or advanced organ failure, can be regarded as disease inflammation, while, for example, patients who have survived cancer will not fall within this categorization. To move GLIM forward, studies presenting inflammation parameters in addition to disease status are necessary. Meanwhile, the GLIM working group is working on a list of diagnoses which may be used to meet the inflammation criterion. Validation papers should be specific in the description of the details on etiologic criteria, as work is required to determine the best measures and cut points. This will help the GLIM group to refine GLIM during the next few years. The GLIM group is already active in filling in some of these gaps in knowledge. For example, cutoff points of body composition measures based on different body composition methods are being developed and recommendations are being made on how inflammation is defined. It is going to be very helpful to have studies that describe how GLIM works with different stages of disease and to see whether categorizing disease severity may be a good proxy to collecting objective parameters of inflammation. Prospective studies provide us with the opportunity to collect all of the data needed to validate GLIM. The more GLIM criteria are included in prospective studies, the better this is going to aid in refining GLIM and specifying GLIM to specific disease groups. Therefore, prospective studies preferably study criterion and predictive validity together. It is recommended that all GLIM criteria and their combinations are tested. As said before, it is essential that it is described how data were collected, which methods were used, and which cutoff points were applied. For example, for body composition cut-off points, it can be studied how different methods and how different cut points relate to each other and how this influences criterion and predictive validity. If for one reason or another data collection is incomplete, this should be clearly described in the limitations of the study. Although not necessary for validation and implementation of GLIM, combination analyses may be interesting for future studies. Different variables can be combined in different combinations and with different cutoff points to study optimal combinations. At this point in time, this kind of study is not necessary for validation purposes. Thank you for your interest in GLIM. Please consult for further guidance the two validation papers that have been published. Thank you.